All right, welcome to Friday Night Tactical. We are live, and we have Scott to my right, left. I'm flipped on the camera. And Stu, you may be muted down below. Make sure you unmute yourselves. Yeah, it's always good to mute now, me most now of the time. we're into the stream. Say something, Stu. Hello, testing one, two. I can't hear you, Scott. Oh. Oh, I can hear him. I cannot hear you. Can't hear me? I can hear <laughs> oh, you. Oh, I got you. I got you. There no, you go. this is a new streaming platform we're trying, so we may have some technical difficulties. I got you now. We are good to go. Um, welcome. Who's Who do we have in uh, chat? We've got 23 viewers. What's everyone up to? Who Who's playing ASL this weekend? And where are you from in the chat? Are we playing ASL this weekend, Scott? Probably not. You need to set uh, I up. Can, I can do that tomorrow. We can play Sunday. Sunday, huh? Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> you could eat it, but you won't like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, there's no way we are not singing. We are not singing. If Amy were here, she would sing for you all, but she's busy. There you she go. will not be able to moder moderate. We are moderating on our own today. We got uh, Mike from Toledo. Edgar from, oh, they're rolling in now. Yeah, there's a little bit of delay. Um, I have to remember that, and you guys in chat need to remember. There's a little bit of a delay here. Oh, some New York guys. Albany. Oh, Albany, you're up late. 10 o'clock back then? Back there? John Payne's play testing one of his own. Kind of playing. William from Queens. <laughs> all, all day. Right. All, nice. all day. Every Very day. nice. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Is anyone playing something other than ASL? Let me ask you that. Got Mississippi Gulf Coast, Don. Oh, very nice. Ten PM, do you know where your children are? We're right here. <laughs> We're right here. 
Uh, Robert, designing east front scenario. Cool, cool. Root and Putin, Japanese lessons. Is that uh, something you want or something you're reading about? Is that, yeah, is that language or PTO? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Vlad, Manila, you're in the Philippines? Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Japanese language, cool. Yeah, very cool, yeah, second front, yeah. Dave's yeah. playing second front, yeah, I played a little bit today. I finally beat, uh, what was it, Last Stand at the Grain Elevator today. Oh, all right. Which is kind of a tough one. Stu, are you playing anything this weekend? Uh... I don't know. With the weather around here, I might get called out for flood problems. So, um, I'd like to try to get something going. Maybe get some more second front going. I haven't played like in about a week and a half. I just yeah, I, I kind of got busy with other stuff and and uh, but yeah, I hope to get some stuff going. I wanted to get I want like I say I wanted to get one of the uh, solo games of uh, Lost Opportunities just to get that map out there of uh, of Drop Zone and uh, to see how that how that goes. I popped it out on uh flipped it up and saw the the map size and uh yeah it's pretty open it looks pretty uh pretty interesting so i probably get that going just to just for around the bend instead unless something comes up but i, I doubt it why well, you scott you plan any bcs play by email mm, i did a log file uh, earlier today but did no you? i don't have any plans to yeah. play this weekend scott's a big bcs fan in case anyone didn't know Don Fuller, I'm getting back in after losing most of my kit to Hurricane Katrina. Oh, that sucks. Mm, bummer. Good that you're getting back in. Let me ask chat. I can't really tell. Uh, is there anyone watching from... Uh, we're streaming to three platforms today. We're streaming oh, wow. to you YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. Is there anyone in chat watching that is not on youtube that's either on facebook or twitch i'm just curious post up if you are what's your twitch handle Neil? mine yeah. uh asl academy academy yeah there it is i can check twitch yeah it's it's running on twitch I, i'm just wondering if anyone's actually watching it on twitch and if the chat works there if someone types in a chat, if it'll show up. Yep, Rudin's got it. Test. Yep, looks good. Nice, it showed up. The Twitch, hey, the Twitch logo even showed up. Very cool, okay. Uh, let's start. Let's, uh, before we jump into this, this. Well, uh, let's do some updates. Stu, uh, what's, what do you have going on or coming up on your uh, channel? In the uh, next well, week or two? It's the next week or two, uh, not exactly sure, but I've been doing a lot of uh, paperwork with the war tournament. Oh, yeah. And um, it's looking pretty good. Uh, I think we had 11 completed games in February. Uh, that was the first month. We had a couple more guys sign on. And uh, right now in my log of games, I think I have... 17 games either completed or in session to be completed and that this is only the one third of the way through the month so uh it's heating up pretty good We've got lots of guys are popping in games getting like two or three games going at the same time and uh try to get those games completed to get their five victories so uh it's uh it's getting hot and heavy i mean a lot more games a lot more games are playing so i'm excited are we gonna see any videos or AARs from that? Yeah, that's channel? the point. Yeah. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take uh, you know, a lot of guys are playing like the shorter scenarios. And so you'll see things like uh, costly baptism, uh, a lot of bounding fire stuff, uh, pulling in flames, uh, maybe even a couple longer ones. I think two guys are playing on the two teams are playing on the borderline. So it's a really lengthy scenario. And then uh, again, we'll do that sort of thing like on Tactical Tuesday, but just with the ASL scenarios. And uh, there'll be, like I say, there'll be a ton of a ton of plays, and um, it'll be interesting. I'm actually learning something. I played a Toten Zontag uh, not too long ago, and I've been watching some of the guys' replays, 
And, um, you know, there's some essentially dead zone setups that uh, you kind of want to avoid, you know, based upon, you know, just the review of the games. It's like, uh, you might not want to sit up there anymore, which you would think initially you do. And so, um, you know, it's it's interesting so far. So it's it's coming along. And uh, at the end of this month, it'll be good. Uh, I changed all the guys. I submitted everyone's results. Like, again, at the end of February, their ASL player ratings adjusted slightly. And so now some players are um, have different availables, different players available to them in the tournament to play against. Again, it's a peer versus peer competition. And uh, no shark in here for the most part uh, until everyone gets the kind of the rating settled and then they can, uh, really, really hammer it out. So, but most yeah. of the games are really look, look really competitive. doesn't look like there's too many walkaways. So that's, that's good to see. That's good to see. Um, I would like to take part in some of your stuff, but as you know, doing or playing ASL <laughs> takes time and running a, this channel and making yeah. videos takes time. Yeah. So, I'm always doing working on something uh, behind the scenes, so I don't really get an opportunity to play in some of your little mini tournaments sometimes, which is too bad. Maybe down the road. Well, this one's lengthy. This is about going to be about three months. Yeah. I anticipate it to be three months. But yeah, it's uh, you have to kind of keep up on your games because uh, it'll probably take about seven to eight games for someone to actually uh, initiate the end of the tournament and probably determine a winner. So look at about... If it stretches through March, it'll be three full months that people can play. But a lot of short scenarios. I mean, a lot of guys. I'll I'll, I'll see plenty of guys start start and finish a scenario one night. So, That's good. but yeah, I hear you. I hear short, you. Short scenarios are good. Yep. Especially for tournaments, obviously. Uh, Scott, what are we playing next? Do you remember? I sent you the setup file. Buck, yeah, Buckley's <laughs> block. Buck Buckley's block. Yeah. Yeah. American Japanese. Yes. And you took? Uh, Americans. The Marine Corps. You had to think on that, didn't you? <laughs> no, I was just which, trying to raise the anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> which means I get the Japanese, which you know what's going to happen, right? Banzai! Banzai! Here they come. Banzai. <laughs> so I think, yeah, we might kick that off Sunday and then have an AR. I don't know, a couple of weeks from now for that. Uh, it looks like it looks like one of those scenarios where a bonsai charge or two might work pretty good. Yeah, trying to recall the terrain. There's not a lot of open ground. There's a lot of orchards, and the Japanese need to move across the board. So yeah, it, you can probably anticipate one or two bonsais from me. Just you don't know where and when. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as uh, what's coming up on this channel ASL Academy um, there will be a giveaway video I think I'm gonna post that Monday we hit 4,000 subs which is awesome great um, I have some stuff to give away I talked about it in the last Friday Night Tactical I had some stuff donated by Derek Ritter that I'm gonna give away from Ritter Creek so big thumbs up to Derek and make sure you frequent his store to order your ASL stuff but I'm gonna put out a video for the giveaway probably on Monday very easy. All you need to do is post a comment on the video and be a subscriber, and boom, you're entered to win free ASL. Um, other, than that, other than that, I think I have another second front video. I recorded a bunch of AF, mastering AFVs, um, second front, and I have another part that's coming, and Scott and I will have our AAR, and then I think I'm going to do a video, a boot camp video, um, about... Uh, vehicle movement and vehicle states of movement, which kind of confuses uh, a lot of players, right? Stop, non-stop, then motion. What do they mean and were they applicable? Uh, I think that'll help out some players. So, so that's what I have going for this uh, channel in the next two to three weeks-ish or so. Okay. Uh, someone had a question. It was, William, you guys play Warfighter. I tried cooperative, didn't play as well as solo. I'm not, do you guys know what Warfighter is? No, no, yeah. not really. You should play oh. it. Okay, what, what is it? It's a solo card game by DVG. Oh, okay. It's pretty good. It's just uh, small. It's just like patrols and stuff, small. You just build a team and you go out and 
try to complete missions. Uh, there's some like people. tactical, like a squad level or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Sort of like up front. Similar. Not similar. Does it have armor, or is it just infantry, or? Yeah, it's got vehicles. So... Um, yeah, they have Europe, and then they came out with PTO, and uh, you can yeah, any kind of pretty much any nation you want to play. Yeah. Wow. Nice. I've never heard of it. Yeah, it's fun. You 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 pick a mission, right? And then you get so many points, and you can build your force, and yeah, yeah it's a ton of replayability. And... Yeah, the problem it's, is, it's, it's fun. You guys know. Every, even the chat knows. Once you commit yourself to ASL, it's oh, it's hard for me. I mean, Scott and I, you, you and I played BCS, and I would read the rules, and I had a hard time packing it in with the ASL rules, mm -hmm. trying to find room. I, yeah. When, once you're really into ASL, it's not, at least in my brain, there's not enough room left to do all these other games. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, I had plans to learn several other games, like OCS and Line of Battle and this and that, but yeah, so far just PCS is the only one I've been able to to learn. So yeah, like I say, ASL just takes a lot of dedication. It takes a lot of CPU power. <laughs> Especially when they keep sending material out that we need to buy, right? <laughs> we just keep picking oh. more up. I, yeah, I'll I'll die before I play a fraction of it, but I keep collecting it because, you know, I'm an addict. <laughs> drop Zone. Do you want to jump into it? Where do we want to start with Drop Zone? Do you want to start with doing a little historical thing or just jump into the rules? Do a historical. Yeah. Do a little historical. Let's see. I have it here somewhere. There it is. Yes, I have some pictures. Guess I should share it. Nope, that's the wrong one. <laughs> share it. There it is. There it is. Let's see if I can rearrange this correctly. All right. <laughs> D-Day, Normandy, June 6, 44. Scott, jump here anytime. Here with your histor historian uh, hat. <laughs> and uh, What do you need to know? <laughs> well, we're, yeah, give, can you give us just a... Uh, I mean, this is specifically drop zone, same Eric Lee's, right? The yeah, the it doesn't well, cover the actual airdrop, but it's right after the airdrop. Maybe you can tell us what happened before the actual beach landings at Utah. Uh, well, same Eric Lee's was the primary objective of the 82nd Airborne because it was a major road junction. It kind of sat astride the the highway from Cherbourg to Paris, which you can kind of see on your map there, I think, but yeah. And right, that's right it here. was, yeah. And nice. then the 100, 101st, the 101st dropped to the south of the 82nd. But the airborne, yeah, the airborne, the, the idea was to, for the airborne to capture the ground uh, west of Utah Beach and, and hold it. Wow. Uh, to the west of oh, so basically in between. Well, right? yeah. To the west of Utah Beach or the west of St. Mary Glees? Well, inland of Utah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it was there was a there was a uh, uh, no man's land between the airborne and the beach, but yeah, they had there was river crossings like the the bridges over the Murder A, that was part of the 82nd's objective too. Uh, these rivers aren't labeled. Is it this one, in this area? Oop, jeez. Uh, that's only river I yeah, see. Okay. This isn't a super detailed map. Yeah, it may not be on there. The, the yeah. river, I think, was in the 101st area, and then the Murder A was in the 80 seconds. But there was the the bridges at Chef Dupont and Lafayette. Mm -hmm. mm. I think I think they're actually doing a historical of that called the yeah 
the bridges or three bridges, so. and they're gonna make it a, a pack or something, a historical pack, I think. Yeah, I think they mentioned something about that Lafayette, and then mm -hmm. Chef Dupont. And... But there was also, I mean, there was you know like Hill Thirty was in there, and Tim's Orchard, and all that. But the 82nd Airborne primarily dropped right, right around here, right. Yeah, or, just or, there, or, or in between, as well. No, it was to the west of St. Mary Glees. The northwest was the the drop zones for the 82nd. Well, okay. For, yeah. Okay, which is what this is. Yeah, this is what we're talking about here. Yeah. Let's jump to the next. Uh, oops, let me turn that off. Oh, this so this shows the actual map. Let me make it bigger here shows the actual map um, and kind of the orientation approximately the orientation on the map north is actually uh, along this axis right like this that's obviously not north but they have to have a I guess a hex row definition for north that kind of works it's, it's close well yeah and, the whole peninsula sits kind of askew it's not perfectly north or it's yeah, yeah. Yeah, is there a north compass on the actual map? I didn't notice on this map. Vlad wants to know if you guys, if you could zoom in, Neil, on that. Which part? Uh, probably the something like this part. This one? Yeah. 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 There you go. So what I did here, I actually scaled down the drop zone map. That's approximately how big it, what it represents, based on the scale at the bottom here. Wow. It's three miles long, the map is. So that's approximately the size in relation to this map and the the uh, land around uh, St. Mary Glees. Zoom in a little more. An approximation. Let's, let's go to the map itself, since I mentioned. So the map is three miles long, arranged in probably the way you, you would actually play it one person on one side of the table it's just too long to have someone on one long end and the other you can't reach anything if you lay it out so it's three miles approximately three miles wide and over on the lower right there there is a standard geo board for reference to show you mm. how big how big the map is so it's probably almost what 12 ish yeah um, looks like four by three yeah of the geo maps roughly yeah, about four by three from the looks of it. That's cool. Utah Beach uh, up in this direction and uh, Sherbourg, Sherbourg to the left, which is north in this direction. And right in the center here is uh, St. Miracles, uh, Fallville, and I don't remember. Newville up then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Mm. Yep. That's yeah, so, pretty cool. With that aside, and again, if you guys have questions uh, in chat, post them up. And you guys, I'm kind of driving here, so if you guys monitoring chat see something, just pipe up and we'll uh, we'll get to it. Before we actually jump into the actual meat of the campaign game, let's uh, talk about what a campaign game is. And let me actually let me ask this question here. Let me pop this up. Are you familiar with MMP style campaign game mechanics? Anyone in chat, anyone viewing? Um, go ahead and answer, we'll go over it in a nutshell after we talk about the three campaign games that are in here. So campaign game one is together we will raise this flag. It has three dates and they're all on June 6th. There's a morning date, an afternoon date and a night date, which means um, you will need night rules for campaign game one at least on the last date and tim asked do any of the campaign game maps use just one or two maps yes two maps campaign campaign game one and two use basically two maps campaign game three uses all the whole thing and then campaign game two 
is Liberation Road. It's three or four campaign game days. One is optional, one day, and it takes place the day after. And the dates are dawn, mid-morning, which is optional, which means it may not actually happen. I think it, it's dependent on what the Americans decide to do. And then there's an afternoon and an evening, but there are no night, no night rules. And then campaign game three is Kraus and Vandervoort, and it's basically a combined campaign game one and two, and it mm. uses the whole thing. So I think when the Vassal map is available, we're still waiting. Um, we are going to do campaign game three. Is that correct, Scott? Uh, yes. We're just going to do it. Because go big or go home. Yeah, I mean, you play you play half, the first half of campaign game three, and you played campaign game one, so you might as well just start it, you know, and just chip away at it over time play the whole thing which is what we plan on doing we're just waiting for the vassal elves to finish someone made the counters so we just need the map now oh i cool. heard they were i think i heard they were play testing the vassal map hmm. like, that would be cool was it kurt Schilling? uh somebody on facebook they were like just they had the, the like they're checking it out to make sure everything worked right far as line of sight probably yeah oh right uh let's see what <laughs> a massive pair drop okay uh, yeah 45 sticks yeah did i did i ask that question did it pop up yeah tim tim's got one there uh yeah pair drops yeah i think so vlad <laughs> i think so there are, there are no pair drops in this which is i'll get your guys' opinion on it well let's just do it now so there are no uh, pair drops in this. Clearly, the initial part of D-Day that this module kind of details involved pair drops. Scott, do you think that it should have had pair drops? They would have been night pair no. drops. No. Yeah, it would have been night. You would have spent, <laughs> I don't know how many turns, just trying to round up people and just make wandering. your way to your objective. Yeah, wandering around. Right. Yeah. What about you, Stu? That's a good point, Scott. Yeah, with the with the openness of the map, and most people aren't going to be dropping into town, and uh, you know, with five three seven range, what is that? You, two hexes? You can't even fire like two hexes within normal range, so you're probably not going to get shot at by anybody anyway. So it would just go through the mechanics of the pair drop. So I guess I'm okay with that. I mean, I love parachute drops because it's just the chaos and the randomness of it. But I really don't see, you know multiple platoons out in the middle of the bocage just shooting randomly you know expecting something to happen so uh, unfortunately well, that's not there but i guess you could do it i mean what the hell the you actual know? the actual landing zones weren't on the map they were you know it was uh, oh, like i said off to the north northwest yeah and then they ventured in yeah well didn't some units yeah, actually yeah. land like right in same air glue yeah right there was right like in the square uh, or whatever yeah like one stick a company f yeah, landed on the. Right so this is why we, this is why we have Scott. I think it would be <laughs> cool for like like a small section, you know, like maybe three sticks, just kind of drop in, you know. I, I I'm not sure the density of the units that are going to be in the game right now, anyway, in terms of the campaigns, but um, you know, it'd be cool just to have a random squad floating in somewhere. Uh, Vlad, yeah, no para drops. I just saw your question pop up. Isn't there? Uh, I thought there was a glider landing though, or something. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna get to that. Uh, but let okay. me let me ask you, Scott. The, what was the weather and visibility like on that night, or early morning? Uh, was it? Well, I think the weather was good. It was. was it? Uh, so the visibility, night visibility range would have been okay, probably. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, but still, you're they're probably spread all over. You'd probably historically, you probably would have spent much time wandering around, just trying to get back together so yeah maybe they made the right choice for just have starting you know gathered up and uh actually they've pretty much already captured i believe they pretty much already captured saint mary Glees where this starts where the campaign game starts okay yeah uh any more questions in chat if not we'll move on uh campaign game mechanics i think i might have asked the question earlier uh, who's familiar with campaign game mechanics? If not, 
and even if you are, we'll just go through it real quick. Um, all MMP, or as far as I know, all MMP campaign games have this sort of mechanic. I call it MMP style uh, campaign game mechanics. So each campaign game has a date, which uh, I kind of went over before. They're usually in the same day. Sometimes the dates can be spread over multiple days. Uh, so, so for instance, the campaign game one has three dates, morning, afternoon, night. Uh, and then, so basically each date is a scenario and each scenario lasts five to eight turns and it is variable. So beginning with turn five, one of the players, I can't remember if it's the Americans or the Germans, it might be the Americans uh, or the attacker. Um, whoever's defined as the attacker rolls one die, one six sided. If it's a one on turn five, the date ends. If it's a three on turn six, I think it ends. If it's a five on turn seven, it ends. And on turn eight, it automatically ends. Wow. Or, or mutual agreement, you can both agree to end a turn or a, a, a date, a scenario. Huh. So it's, you know, you don't, you don't know what you're going to get. You don't know if you're going to get five turns or eight turns. So you have to kind of adjust your, uh, you know, how fast you're moving and how fast you're attacking if you're on the attack. But after each date, there's what's called a refit phase. And there are more steps to it than this, but it's generally composed of things like uh, unit recovery. Let me make this a little bigger. Uh, unit recovery, re repair, recombining, etc. cetera. Uh, determining setup areas for the next date. And that was that's the least favorite part for me because you have to draw. Mm -hmm. You basically have to draw your control areas for both your sides. And it's dependent on strategic locations that you capture, which can be buildings and other things, depending on the campaign game. And then you have to draw these zones. And if you get overlaps, they're called no man's land. And there can be a little bit confusing. I didn't, I don't really like this part of it. Um, <laughs> that's yeah. Other than this, that part of it, the refit phase is fine. You're just kind of checking things off, right? Getting ready for the next uh, part of the, the campaign game. Um, and then there's a phase called escape and, and shift, meaning um, if you're in a no man's land, if you're kind of surrounded, like if I'm playing Scott and my I have guys deep into his territory, but he has controlled a strategic lo locations that surround me, I have to try to escape my units during the refit phase. And things can happen like you cannot escape, you can take casualties, etc. Same with shift. Once you set up these control zones, if you want to shift to a different zone, you have to make a die roll for those units. You might want to say, I want to move these units over to uh, this other zone to bolster it. You have to make a die roll to oh, see okay. if they actually are able to do it. They either can't do it or they take casualties or they're able to shift. These are wow. the types of mechanics that happen in between. Or I think they can set up off board in, a, in an entry area. You can actually move them off the board, but then they have to re-enter instead of setting up in these different setup areas. And then there's replenishment and reinforcement and spending campaign purchase points. You'll get campaign purchase points depending on things that might have happened or depending on what side you're on. And then you buy units. So there's a lot of var variability in campaign games um, on choices you have to make based on what's come before. And you want to preserve your units going forward as well. Then after you get through the refit phase, you basically play the next date, which might be the afternoon date, the new scenario. You play through it, um, and you end either on turn five through eight, and then you do the refit phase, and you do that until the scenarios end, and one side meets the victory conditions or one side doesn't. The victory conditions usually apply to the entire campaign game, not one scenario. There's not usually not date or scenario specific uh, victory conditions. It's usually one large victory condition for the entire campaign game. So the campaign game mindset is completely different than playing a um, normal scenario. Um, I like to call it live the fighter another day because you have to make choices with all of your units. You know, how risky do you want to get? Because you have to preserve those units for the next date. That they're going to be fighting mm -hmm. the next date type of thing. So you, you, you know, when you play a regular scenario, you just kind of go, 
you know, yeah. you go crazy. You just run stuff in the open or whatever just to try to capture the victory. You can't Bonsai. do that here. Yeah, you just kind of go lose your mind sometimes. <laughs> I think you guys need to send send Vlad your uh, end of day stuff so he can determine your setup areas for your next day. He seems to be pretty experienced in the campaign games. Yeah, <laughs> just send him off. I missed it. You get some help, help wanted or so, uh, or work wanted. Say, hey, you know, I I, I can determine your perimeter zones. You know, yeah, well, five dollars per campaign day. Not a fan of that, but you know, <laughs> we work through it. It's fine. Uh, it just <laughs> involves sitting at a planning map and drawing. You know perimeters and and then and then getting with your opponent which in my case is usually scott and, and kind of overlaying them and, and then arguing about the parts that don't match and right figuring it out negotiating the civil yeah. engineer to resolve your fights right uh tim said looks like this looks like a more manageable campaign game on the servers yeah we were talking about that before the stream we agree this this is probably one of the more manageable and approachable uh campaign games Sort of like a decision on else graduated. Uh, yeah. Because you guys played the AA, right? You guys finished that a couple of years ago. Yeah, that that's. Yep. I mean, whether you play ASL or full ASL or Star Kit, decision on else is probably a really good introduction to campaign games because it's fairly, you know, it's fairly simple. The rule sets a little less than full ASL, but it has all the stuff. It has all the mechanics in it. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Oh yeah. Just don't play the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking oh. of, so I threw in. Uh, this was one of the the control maps that we did for Decision at Alps. Oh, nice. Know, two, three That's... years ago, whatever it was. Yeah. So you see, you have the there all the buildings. I think the buildings were the only strategic locations. So there's rules on you know, I think within two hexes. Two hexes, that, yeah. Yeah, you control the territory two hexes away from a strategic location. Huh. So where the lines are close, there's overlap, right? If there's he controls this building and I control this building, our zones overlap. That's called a no man's land, right? And then these other zones are, are not controlled. So wow. you kind of have to go through this process between each uh, campaign game day. This is the part I didn't like. How did you set that up? That looks pretty pretty legit. Uh, well, this is just, uh, I think I, I just scanned this. Oh, wow. I, mean, I, you know, I took a photocopy of the map, of the planning map and we just draw on it. Okay. All right. And then, then I just scanned it, uh, oh, it looks pretty just cool. for illustrative purposes. And then these zones set up, these zones represent setup areas for the next date. You can yeah. set up your units in these zones or they have to remain in these zones. Or if I want to shift from you know kneel one zone over to this zone i have to make a roll to see if the shift is successful that's what, what i was referring to before. oh that's what the shifts are for for yeah. separate zones completely yeah. separate zones okay i got you if, if the, yeah if there's units in this zone but i want to set them up over here the next date i have to do a shift and yeah. you can take casualties for that that's crazy yeah if you roll if you roll bad you can take casualties that's not good now could you shift could like the germans shift into that small zone in the bottom i'm going through your zone, air territory does it have to be neutral uh let's see over here yeah can you can you do no. like a shift between those these two? guys i think these guys would be called isolated mm -hmm. maybe someone in chat can can confirm yeah, it's been a few years since we played a campaign game these they're probably considered isolated so he couldn't shift in there all right there in fact if he you might have had units in here when we played. Um, he had to shift out, probably, and there was probably like a negative modifier for shifting out of an isolated zone. I can't That's remember. when you try to escape, right? When it's isolated. Yeah. Oh, yeah. is that what that is? Yeah, yeah. okay. That makes yeah, maybe sense. It's, maybe it's escape when you're when you're isolated like that. Mm. Yeah. Root and Putin says, yeah, they would be isolated. Correct. Yeah, so there's a lot of cool stuff that actually happens with campaign games in between the stuff that's kind of interesting yeah that's cool that's cool wounded wounded leaders can recover you know yeah all that all that stuff all the attrition you took you check to see how well you recover from it as well what about like immobilized vehicles i mean you get your 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 wounded leaders you know big superman they pull the bullet out of his leg and wrap him back up throw him back in the front Immobilized vehicles, uh, like a jeep or something. I think like you had that. to roll. I think you had to roll for them. I know that 
vehicles with like broken guns could repair. I'm not. I can't remember immobilized vehicles. Okay. Yeah, because some because some games are like different, like full days, right? Like like January fifth, January sixth, and in, in other campaign game days, it's like two hours later, you know. And so it's kind of interesting that they might use the. I don't know if they do, but they might use the same mechanic in terms of wounded leaders or heroes getting back into the fray and things like that. So. I can't remember uh, how mobilization works. Okay. Uh, Root and Putin, you have to roll for mobilization. Yeah, maybe you can can repair it. I just don't. Recall. Okay, that's cool. And, and it may be a little bit di different for every uh, campaign game as well. Yeah, different just, modifiers. Probably. It might just Something depend like on the action and the where the geography and all that. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to check that out later. What do we have up here? Oh, let's let me pop that back up getting used to the controls on this thing hopefully it's working out that looks good uh this is so this is campaign game one in the morning this is basically how, how they set up so the americans have already captured uh semi -Aragles. this is the morning of june 6th so they've as scott said i guess they've all gathered up during the evening and actually went in and taken it and the germans are basically uh counter -attacking. Um, and the, the things you have to control for campaign game one are there's this large building. I can't read it because this map is not very high res. Right. Yeah, I can't I can't read what it is. And and or they have to put firepower on this uh, certain amount of firepower on this road hex as well. So they have to capture the building and, and put firepower on the road hex that the Germans do. And the Americans get reinforcements behind the Germans on turn four. Hmm. That's the morning. Uh, and then Scott, here you go. You're asking about glider landers landings. There are no pair drops, but there are. A, there is a glider landing. So this is the afternoon. There's going to be fighting all through here, obviously, right? From from the morning. All right. Right. That's where all the action is going to be happening. Germans get reinforcements on turn one right away, and then American gliders, eight of them. Load it up, land, land on turn five over on this zone. So you've got, this looks like a really chaotic campaign game. You got units coming in from all kinds of different sides, different ways, and there's just gonna be a bunch of fighting going actually probably both directions, trying to trying to secure either hold uh, Saint Mary Lee's or recapture it, depending on what side you're on. So you think it turns into like a little mini red barricades right there in San Mary Glees instead of like a whole four foot map you got like a four inch map yeah all the, all the I think all the fighting is going to concentrate you know kind of like this like like this yeah <laughs> towards, <laughs> towards the center yeah <laughs> very cool uh and then the last date for campaign game one is night so night night visibility range is three. So all the fighting is going to be at night. You know, probably predominantly in here. Maybe, yeah. maybe some over here. And, Don's got a uh, Don's got a question. Are the glider units more of the eighty second? Uh, I don't know how to click on that thing. Um. Yeah. They were. I got it. Uh, I can't remember the unit name, but yeah. But they were were they associated with the eighty second? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. They were supposed to be the gliders were supposed to be bringing in more anti tank guns and anti aircraft guns and more support equipment stuff that's like where, that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Were there any vehicles coming in on gliders, or did all the vehicles mainly come from Utah? Uh, it would have been just jeeps, if anything. Yeah. But yeah. You know. I think there are some jeeps in here in the. Orders of battle. Hold those fifty yeah, sevens around. The guns around. Yeah. 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 So that, on those roads. that's it for campaign game one in a nutshell. You have to capture Americans have to hold Semergles. Germans have to capture this building and put down a certain number of firepower and be within a certain number of hexes, I believe, of this road section here for campaign game one. Hmm. Campaign game two is called Liberation Road, and it starts the next day at dawn. Oh. Um, and in this one, I guess they assume the Americans 
still have control at the beginning. And uh, the Americans want to push north. Left is north here. So uh, they have to control that, that building, whatever the name, whatever it's called, I can't remember. And they have to push 30 exit victory points off the board uh, in this direction, off of this edge. Wow. And the, the Germans are counterattacking here. So that's the beginning of campaign game two. Wow. The, the, the dawn, uh, the mid-morning is optional. I believe if the Americans choose not to attack, there is no campaign game or date two. You just skip it. Or maybe there's some special scenario rules may say what you have to do. Maybe something special happens. But there, there's no real scenario, as I recall. And it's kind of funny that you mentioned earlier, Neil, that the uh, the map, simply because of the way, the size of the map, it's kind of like playing on Vazel. You're like side by side instead of like, you know, you can't be on, I'm on this side, you're on that side because of the length of the map on some of these scenarios. Right. Yeah. The, this, uh, I mean, like most campaign games, I think this uh, lends itself to being played on Vazel. That's why we're waiting. Yeah, it's not giant. You know, you don't have a, you know. Uh, yeah gigantic different thing yeah that makes sense yeah. that makes sense that'd be cool uh everybody go out and buy your 54 inch monitors <laughs> or or 50 foot table one of the two yeah <laughs> uh, campaign uh, game. Have, yeah <laughs> go ahead uh, clearance of 82 inch monitors 82 inch yeah. TVs. <laughs> so date three is the afternoon um maybe it's four now, two is mid-morning, three is afternoon. So all the fighting is going to be raging, you know, in this area. I believe this is a level one. I couldn't tell if this was depression or elevation. This, no, it's this, elevation, this, yeah. yeah. You it's, get that right. Yeah. It's elevation after I thought about it and looked at it a little bit more. Um, and then there's German reinforcements coming in from the north. So the that's, where Scott, are... that's where Scott's uh, smear, uh, poured his coffee on their map. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the Americans are going to keep trying to push to the left, to the north, and the Germans are going to push it, uh, coming in from the north on turn. Sorry, not turn, but date three. And then date four, the last one is evening. Again, the Americans are have to, I think they have to start behind this line. I can't remember why I put that there. I think they have to set up behind that line. But I wonder what happens if they push further than that. I can't recall. And then they can... Uh, reinforcements come in on the east and south edge, Americans, but they're still continuing to push north to wow. meet, the, meet the victory conditions, victory point conditions. So that's game. That's campaign game one that I showed you previously. That this is campaign game two. I didn't do a campaign game three summary because it's basically a campaign game one and two combined um, with a few few differences i think in between but it's basically they've mashed them together and there's some uh maybe special scenario rules that uh come into play cool yep cool Are there any more questions that i missed uh Let's vlad wants to know if you get any reinforcements at all in the cg yeah mm -hmm. so you get both uh in this campaign game you get in some dates you actually get uh, reinforcements assigned to you they're actually specified you also get uh, campaign purchase points which you, yeah, can you gotta buy them buy units okay and that's cool I, I can show that here i think that's it for the maps that's all the maps we have let's look at the let's look at the the ssr where are we at we're at 747 i think we're doing pretty good yeah um the sturm units you you were wondering about that, Stu. You have some uh, comments about the Sturm. I just, you know, the only thing the I have, unfortunately, I don't have a, a ton of positive comments, but uh, <laughs> it just, <laughs> it just seems I don't know. Um, I, I, you know, again, I'm not a big historian. You guys are much more knowledgeable than I am, but uh, you know, it just seems like it's almost like we have like a half a sheet of counters just to be token counters to be placed in there and um in the stern i mean everyone loves the new german unit i guess i mean but good lord another german i'd rather have another american unit 
than a, than a German unit. I mean, that's that's another slot in your box that you gotta you gotta buy. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I'd I'd keep these separate in the. Yeah. The so, box. but uh, uh well, five three a... sevens are great. It, it makes it makes them against. Let's see it. That yeah. The, so it gets a, the five three seven against the seven four seven in close combat. The seven four seven will only be one to one against them. So that is a huge difference in CC versus the five three sevens. That's a, I mean, by a half firepower, they uh, they avoid the three to two, and you know, that's I think that's a big deal because that's the that's the big one of the biggest strengths the Americans have, even their six 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 is in close combat with your standard four firepower squad, they're all three to two. Well, so. what's what's the other thing this bonus the five three seven adds? Uh, I don't know. Maybe they're good cow herders. I don't know. <laughs> we'll get to the cows. <laughs> we will get to the cows. No. They speak cow. They, they... <laughs> no, I actually did a I did a tactical tip on this a while ago. They have an underscored five. Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. Assault so, fire. Yeah. Yeah. So their firepower after moving is basically identical to if they just sat yep. and fired. Yep. Right. Unless you have a, a stack of three, right? Right, around, right. Which you're probably not going to be doing, right? So you're going to have, if you fire one or two squads in prep fire, you're going to have four firepower or eight, right, rounding down. If you right. move them, you're going to have four or eight. So given these 537's assault fire is also a huge advantage as opposed to using the standard I don't know four six sevens, which have good range, obviously, but uh, yeah. they don't have assault. I don't think they have assault fire. Yeah, I love the assault fire. I mean, the five four eights. I mean, the I think that's the one good representation of the five three seven reduction of range. You still have spray fire. Again, most of the terrain will hopefully be bocage, you know, and uh, so that's plus two right there. So the extra firepower. But the seven morale, I think, is the real big. Influencer, it's not like they're five four eight, so they really can't stand toe to toe a lot. Uh, the Americans will still over over firepower them and uh, hopefully put the hurt on the Germans. Yeah, there is a note, uh, design note, footnote one that explains their design design decision of doing five three seven. And I read it, and I can't recall, and I don't want to spend time reading through it again. But uh, if you're <laughs> curious why they use five three sevens, they answer it in in footnote one. Yeah. Uh, let's see, bocage and gaps. Okay, I found this one interesting. All hedges are bocage. Why didn't they use bocage graphics on the map? Right, right. They use hedge graphics. Well, they're all bocage. Right, it doesn't why make any they, sense. Why did they use hedges instead of bocage? I thought that was <laughs> strange. And then, then they put in an SSR that says they're all bocage. Yeah, it's a... Uh, I don't know what happened there. But... Pointless. <laughs> pointless. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You know, because I mean, I mean, even a vassal, right? You do the vassal transformation. That's bocage. You see it. You see like the little brown mound on it, and the trees are coming up. It's it's pretty badass, and they're pretty thick. So yeah, yeah. Maybe it was difficult for them to do. I don't. I have no idea. I just I just noticed that why they're just hedges, but then they call out bocage. Um, I think these next ones have to do well. There's some there's some weird uh, road situations. David Garvin was right, by the way, on the smoke question. I like uh, I like that it has a reference. Uh, gaps in Bokash hex sides are you know gaps, and it has references to B nine B nine point five, and then it has like four or five lines. They could have just added the description of actually what the gaps do for you instead of having to reference it. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> look, say um, I didn't even notice the gaps. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, that's right. And, uh, David says, you know, once we play it on Vazel, it, you'll have your bocage right there, baby. At least it better work, right, well, David? Well, if they put trans transform transformations in. Oh, I God. I don't they know better. if they will. Oh, God, they better. It should come default right there. That's a, that's a good idea, Neil. You should you should get a hold of the uh, Vazel Elves and make sure it's just defaulted that way. I don't have that power. You do. I, I, I you, <laughs> unleash the power of Grayskull. <laughs> Skeletor. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah. So that's why we hide Scott. <laughs> yeah, Scott. Can you get on that, please? Uh, yeah. We need right we need, away. We need I'm on bocage, it. not hedges. Uh, then there's some rules. I don't care what it has. I just want a map. <laughs> yeah, we'll take a map, even if it has hedges on it. That's fine. 
Uh, so there's some rules for some funky roads that run right next to buildings. Uh, street fighting. Uh, no. yeah, 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 street fighting because yeah. there's street some fighting. really, really close roads to buildings. Uh, yeah. I did like the village square rule. I gotta be honest with you. I mean, I'm Mr. Negative Nancy over here, but the village square it? rule, it's like, like if if like you've got like a, your tanks or jeeps or crap like that, you don't pay the penalty of driving through the hex because it's like the whole damn hex is a road. So at least that's what I interpreted from it. There's no additional MP cost for vehicles or wrecks that are in a hex. So that's kind of cool. I kind of like that little bling to the rule where you just everybody could drive through there, no penalties. So not that it'll be a big deal, but I think it's kind of it makes sense. You know, that's one of the things that makes sense. Uh, and the building cool. the the building road one the is uh, is also kind of nice. Um, the one thing I didn't like about the building road, again, I think it makes it, it makes a little more sense, is the, um, I don't know, I, I'd like to say the consistency of, uh, like, narrow roads and things like that, or bypassing, or the way they were describing it, uh, you know. And, of course, I looked up the narrow roads in the, uh, in the original rule book, and, well, like in normal bypass, like the vehicles, you know, there's got to be a certain amount of space for your vehicle to go by in the normal rigmarole of an ASL game. And it looks like the narrow roads, that they don't really care. There could be, you know, there could be a sidewalk and your King Tiger can, uh, you know, be on that road, on that thing. So t for me, I, I like to see kind of consistency, but I guess if you just do campaign games, you're kind of used to that already. So that's just something stupidly minor. But again, uh, I, I, I just like, there's a lot of things that people can get confused and forget and stuff like that. And for me, that would be something that I'd have to try to remember and play more often. I'd have to be more experienced and adept at narrow roads and all these campaign games. But that's just me. But otherwise, it looked pretty cool. And, and that I'm not a big fan of either. The, uh, the zigzaggy road. And the irrigation, yeah, I'm sorry, so, but but it just seems kind of weird. I, you know, I was again, I was looking through the uh, red barricades rules, and you know how they have the the rail lines are just straight, right, and just kind of runs along the the hex sides, even the zigzags, and it says just just treat them as walls, and it's like I'm not sure why they couldn't kind of done the same sort of thing here and treat them as walls. I, I don't know, I don't know. It just seems again another another uh variation from the norm and you know people have difficulty enough with bocage blocking lines of sight along the sides and things like that and this one allows you to see down the side of a bocage but they have to be moving or routing and so i think that could be kind of confusing especially with the rig you know the whole battle going on i would forget that all day long that's all, that's all there is to it but I understand the limitations they have on the hex grid and all that other crap, but that's why, um, they, that's why they did it, I guess. Yeah, but it's I just, know. I just, I mean, they they don't have to their their hedges or their bocage doesn't have to follow the hex sides, in my opinion. Especially if it's on a hazel map, right? You don't have to worry about <laughs> anything else. If you play in this one, you're playing you're playing drop zone, right? So the rules are isolated to drop zone, and. uh Hell, you can go, you can go hog wild on it, you know, and just uh, really change the map up the way you really want to, and uh, but Bokaj would have that has to follow hex sides, right? That's the whole way wall advantage works and declaring wall advantage. I don't know how you would do it otherwise. Right. Well, if you look at the at the rail lines, like the because uh, I, I looked it up, it's like holy shit, they already have this, and that's from from a. Um, uh, God, I don't even know the original name of it. Uh, Red Barricades. The Red Barricades has got like the rail lines going down, and they're straight. Those are straight. They don't go zigzaggy, and it says treat them as walls. And so it's oh, like, oh, you Whoa. mean it, you mean it runs down a hex spine, and then uh, then is that what you mean? Well, it's it's sort of like it's sort of like if that like, were uh... yeah, the, it's like the rail line would be straight, but it's along the side of the hexes. Yeah, just like, like that. that? Oh. Yeah, and then like obviously. If your fire is crossing that hex side, crossing the thingy, then it's a wall. It's sort of, it's sort of like they like Hatton and Flames, that stupid rail line that's that's a hillock. 
you know, it's the same sort of concept, but a little more simpler. And it looks clean, to be honest with you. It looks clean to me. But, again, that's just me. I mean, I, just, yeah. I, like, I like pretty maps, and I think it would be... It's not that hard to understand. I mean, if you had... If you had, it's sort of like, you know, if, if you've got half orchards, right? If you've got a half orchard and you have to understand that the hindrance only applies on that half side, depending on where the fire is coming from, you already have the concept in the game. It's not like you're introducing a new concept, but, uh, yeah, but it's, I mean, it's not, the rule section isn't long. It's not no, that complicated. No, it's not. Yeah. It, it is what it is. Yeah. Let's move on. Uh, I don't want to get to the cows. <laughs> irrigation ditches uh they're a little bit like polder is, is if i recall but they're not they're similar to polder i guess from decision announced uh double roadblock i think they introduced double roadblock just to be able to block this uh zigzaggy road really Thoughts? Nothing. They could have just used two roadblocks. Or two, or <laughs> two, two roadblocks. Because a, a roadblock, yeah. there's nothing special about it. It's just a yeah. normal roadblock. Yeah. You could destroy like, one, and yeah. then you, you just have to put a regular so, roadblock there. Yeah. So, uh, but hey, it's it's a fan, it's a fancy looking counter, which yeah. uh, you know it's cool. It's a good concept. You know, I like the, the zigzag. But yeah, two roadblocks do exactly the same thing. There's, yeah, there's nothing to the rule. It's just yeah. Two. two I think what it does, I I think the counter is maybe to, because there's no road on that bottom hex side, the bottom hex going. And so technically you can't put the road yeah, there. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of what it's for, I, which is cool. I'm fine with that. That's no fine. problem. Okay. Cows. Okay. I, uh, David says, good thing. No King Tigers fought against Americans in Normandy. Yeah. Uh, I read the cow rule and it actually made me a little sad. All right. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Uh, and maybe Scott, from your readings, maybe you can. Did you read the cow rules? And is it kind of accurate with what happened? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it, as far as I know, the only cow action was uh... <laughs> cow action. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. It was uh, morning of June sixth. It was south of Saint Mary Glees. They came up. The Germans came up from Fauville, and they pushed the cows up in front of them. Uh, that's as far as I know, that was the only time the cows were involved. I'll be doing that. You know, when I was reading the cow rules, what thing came to mind was like a Monty Python skit, and they're like grabbing like the pieces of like <laughs> f like brush, and they're walking down the road trying to be concealed and stuff like that. <laughs> That's just it's it's okay. it's, it's well, just, I wanna... just the mobile hindrance that your mobile tem you're hanging around. <laughs> so... uh... So why didn't the why didn't the Germans why didn't the Germans dress up in cow suits? I know, right? And then... Blend in like a cartoon. Yeah. Like uh, the coyote wearing a, a uh. sheep suit. <laughs> suits. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, yeah, that's kind of sad too. I was reading it's like, oh yeah. The I mean, trail breaks and stuff like that. That's Although, what happened, but yeah. yeah, it's kind of brutal. Yeah. I mean, okay, in a nutshell which is my, my favorite word when I try to summarize ASL things, is uh, the two things that stood out to me is if... So the Germans can herd the cows, and a cow counter rep represents like a herd, not like a cow or two. It's a whole herd. Oh, crap. So they can be blended in with the herd, and I believe it negates moving in the open. It's a hindrance, and it's plus one temp. Yeah. And if they get fired on... If they take a casualty result or a KIA, it comes out of the cows first. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Much, pretty much. So you can kill cows instead of your units. I, then, I think, I hope nobody in the ASO community is a member of PETA because they're probably going to have complaints about this. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> it gets better. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, you I'm can, sorry. Minefield clearance. You can, herd, <laughs> you can herd them into a minefield and blow them up. <laughs> clear I would never do that. Or discover a minefield. Yeah. <laughs> Is there enough heat jitter by, by an exploding mine to cook the meat? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I read the, the cow rules the other night, and I'm like, wow, this is kind of depressing. <laughs> then you flip, it over to, you flip it over to the dead cow side. And it's yeah, exactly. Are they steaming? So... Are they steaming? Or is that just... <laughs> 
Uh, no, I think it's just sticks. It's but I gotta say, I gotta tell you, for as much shit that Critical Hit gets, they had cows before MMP. <laughs> and they were faster. What, really? Where, where <laughs> were they, what were they in? I mean, I... They were in, uh, like, Mabatang or something like that. Uh, huh. It's, a uh, they're carousels. They're, but they did exactly the same thing. And the other thing they did is they reduced the, the firepower of the minefield. They literally cleared the minefield out for you. <laughs> Absorbed it. Yeah, it was kind of weird. The rules are still kind of like jerky because, you know, critical hit, but but the concept is there. And um, I honestly literally bought that uh, module simply for the cows. <laughs> so, the cows. so, yeah, you can use cows. The Germans, uh, I don't, can the Americans? I think the Americans can, you have to like, yeah. they're to treat mm -hmm. a little bit like prisoners, I think. You have to yeah. like possess them and move around with them. Yeah. If you don't possess them, they they don't move with you, but I think the Americans can grab them too. <laughs> so I, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, people are making jokes about it, and it, we're still kind of joking about it. But it's a little morbid, right? You yeah. Use it. Use them as bullet sponges, and then you blow them up in minefields. It's kind of kind of morbid. Yeah. It did say that. Well, and then you have a barbecue in the minefields in the game, though, which is kind of odd to me. You know. So, Are there? I don't know. I haven't looked at like no, all no the order mines. battle. There's, yeah, no so there's no minefields in the game. It's like, well, no, those are their mines. Maybe they put it in for so people can use them in other scenarios. Yeah, it said something about for uh, yeah, for future okay. or for yeah. other games. Right. Scary. I need more. I need whole. I need uh Jersey cows. Holsteins. Yeah, these are Holsteins on there. So <laughs> wardrobe. <laughs> Ass. Are there para drop scenarios in this pack, or do the scenarios all take place after the drops? There are no para drops in the campaign game. I can't speak to the actual scenarios. Do you guys know uh, the individual so. scenarios? If there are, I didn't drops? see any. I, didn't, I honestly didn't see any. The the campaign games take place after the everyone's landed and kind of gathered up. But there may be para drops in the scenarios. I'm not sure. Yeah, let me let me flip through those real quick. Uh, that's it. That's it for the special scenario rules. Um, then there's the beginning of the campaign game section. Uh, all the definitions on you know refit phase, setup area. Uh, oh, snipers. You get two sniper counters in St. Mary Glees. So I could have a hundred sniper counters. It wouldn't do me any good. <laughs> <laughs> With a sand of seven. And they all activate at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but. I think you have, you have two sniper counters, but when you get a sniper activation, you randomly roll to see which one gets activated. But you can, it's kind of have multiple snipers that are spread out that you can still only take one sniper action if it gets activated. I think most, I didn't see any, uh, I just thumbed through the scenarios. I didn't see any parachute drops. Uh, the one thing about the scenarios though, I did notice is that um, uh, with the exception of like two or three, they seemed pretty low density nice tight infighting sort of like the old paratrooper scenarios where you have like eight guys per side the lost opportunities has it does have 18 german squads but eight of those are conscripts so they're moving pretty damn slow especially bocage and um but they look uh pretty playable in terms of uh time and speed because there's not a lot of vehicles involved in most of them and or just on one side so i think you can uh, at least the scenarios look to be um, one one afternoon games if you guys do some face to face, which is, you know, be cool. Did I miss any questions? Yeah, Other wardrobe. Drops. They're they're mostly they're most they are mostly small. I mean, like the map. I was checking out the lost opportunities one. The map uh, compared to the ASL scenario and paratrooper. The map is like wider versus long and lost opportunities, but and it's really different in terms of what it's doing. It's just kind of like repeating for the the title, but uh, but yeah, they look they're pretty small. They look pretty tight because your guys are going to be spread out. The density of units is going to be hopefully, um, you know, manageable. I'm not a big, you know, three stacks of guys on ground first and second level type of dude, so. Just yeah. I avoid those games like the plague. For for me, I thought that was pretty cool that they took previously published scenarios and converted them to the historical map. Yeah, that's cool. Neat. That's yeah. cool. 
Yeah, nice addition. Uh, here's the full refit phase sequence that I kind of uh, boil down to a few bullets. It's it's much more lengthy. And then here's a uh, you get into the tables of things like escape tables, <clears throat> trying to escape from isolation, I believe. Uh, whether you're a vehicle or infantry uh, modifiers, shifting, shift to safety, no shift, shifted with possible casualties. Or you can be eliminated if you roll a greater than or equal to 12 with modifiers. So yeah, you can you could try to shift. You could uh, potentially take some casualties. Uh, and I don't think... Uh, so here's the first campaign game, and you can see the initial orders of battle. There's not a lot of armor in this. There's some, but it's not, it's not an armor or vehicle heavy uh, campaign right. game, which is kind of nice, which to me, that means it's probably going to move fairly quickly. Vehicles always slow down play. I was looking at some of the maps too, and it seemed like most of the maps, the Bocage, uh, like farmlands or whatever like that, are pretty reasonable in terms of like jumping over the Bocage and, you know, CXing. You can actually make it to the other wall instead of getting stuck out in the open. So if you wanted to hunt down those tanks, uh, I think you can kind of get around to them just like you can, like in a lot of the scenarios that you guys play. You can kind of. You know the the tanks aren't aren't you know don't have a great time. They can be attacked and destroyed. I think I think pretty easily. I got some screenshots up. You can kind of see the countryside. Yeah. And the town. The zigzag road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, this is just to show you. This is a campaign purchase point table for the Americans and the Germans. So you can or you can buy things like leaders uh support weapons vehicles in this case jeeps and or and anti-tank guns and then you can get special you can get leaders squads uh roadblock concealment same with the germans so there's a lot of variability when you play a campaign game to decide what you want to do on the next date going forward yeah you gotta have that variability yep uh Campaign games are not static scenarios. They're very dynamic because, you know, like I said at the beginning, live the fight another day. You could have a really crappy morning, come out of it, do your refit, spend some points judiciously on what you need, and jump in the next day, reset up, and you're right back in the fight. Now, in terms uh, of the campaign game, like you say, the purchases deal, um, is there like one cookie cutter strategy like just purchase if you don't purchase like two companies of infantry you're just going to lose that day sort of you know locked into buying that sort of crap you know that's the tricky part yeah you know? I, don't, I don't i mean because you can like that. really you know scooch the pooch on that one there if you don't because if you want to try something wild and wacky like i do sometimes uh are you just going to instantly lose it pretty much, you know, I, uh, that would no, be disappointing. I don't think you're going to instantly lose because I mean, you don't know if the, the session or date's going to last five to eight turns. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. You can find, you can find yourself in uh, kind of a world of hurt that, you know, you, that you didn't spend properly. So you don't push as hard and you say, okay, I'm just going to set up for the next date, which you can do, right? You can, you know, if you if you're playing the the morning date and you're like, ah, things aren't going well, I should have bought something yeah. else. You can try to position your units to get ready for the next date, right? And buying something different or something that'll help you during that date. So it's I think it's kind of hard to answer that question. And I th I think like you you touched on it earlier on the uh, on your schematic of the of the campaign game where if 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 you think you've screwed the pooch, like ah oh, shit all of his guys are on the right-hand side, then, like you say, you just pull back, preserve those forces, lose that, you know, two or three Bocage fields, and just set up for the next day. Just automatically just pull back and go defensive. I, I don't know. Again, I haven't played a campaign yeah. game, but you can't, like, just leave them on the front line. Oh, I'm going to fight till I die because the scenario is going to be over. But no, it doesn't matter. You can. I remember when we played Decision at Elst, um, there was a rule, and it may be in this one, where uh, depending on your casualties from the previous day, 
you're able to recover some units. So if you lose a bunch, oh right, okay, you're able to re recover some. You like get replenished basically. And if you do the math right and you keep track of it right, at the end of the day, you can say, oh okay, if I if I lose one more squad, I get the next replenishment on the table. I'll get I'll get that a squad back. So if I lose okay. a squad at the end, it won't really matter. Okay. And you'll do something like rush down the road to grab that building to be a strategic location to get your setup area a little bit bigger for the next date. Right. You can do that. I don't know if that's in uh, drop zone, but it was in decision at L. Sometimes at the end of decision at L, I think a few times I might have done something a little crazy just because I knew I'd get a squad Get that back. building. Yeah, yeah get just, that to building. Try to, just try to push a little further right at the end. And it'd be worth it, right? If you, even if you lost the squad, the attempt to get that extra building again to give you extra three or four hexes of of your setup area, yeah, would be worth it. Yeah. Possibly, yeah. So you have to make that, those kind of that. decisions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's it. This is this is just all the details for each of the campaign games. Units you start with, units you buy for each date, etc. I'm not going to go through all that. I think we've come to the end of Drop Zone Saint Mary Glees. No, the beginning. The beginning, because we need to see your yes. campaign game. <laughs> yeah. This is just the beginning. <laughs> it is the Which is good for us, because Scott and I have been waiting for this. We are going to play it, start it. as soon. Yeah, as you it, guys have been chatting about this for like a long time. As soon as the Vassal Mat comes out, we're going we're gonna to kick it off. So, I'm sure you'll see some AARs or summaries or videos about yeah. this uh, down the road. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, David makes a good point. All the guys are, are reading his comment about, you have to ask yourself, do I want to lose the terrain, the men, or just the terrain? Terrain and the men, or just the terrain? Yeah, they pop that Yeah, up. that's huge. Yeah. yeah. So when you're have when you experienced like David and, and Vlad in these campaign games, they already know all those answers. I, I have none. I just I just have a tendency just to screw things up. Yeah. The, <laughs> I'm not going to speak for Scott, but, and you can chime in afterwards, but can't playing a campaign game is completely different than playing a regular scenario the mindset you need to know it's a long extended battle with multiple phases and different units you can buy once you get your starting units you have to change the way you actually play the game and approach it yeah totally any, uh, any it's, key it's, strategy it's different, like... you guys use any key strategies you guys use in a campaign that you do not see I mean, other than what we've just discussed, any real like something that you wouldn't think of normally that if I if I had known that it's like, oh, I would have I would have done a lot better. Like, I mean, some simple well, thing, not complex, but just like. No, not really. I mean, but as far as like compared to a regular game, a regular game of ASL, you know, even whether you're attacking and defending, you can always try to do something like crazy to try and win but in a campaign game like playing the germans in elst i never i think i may have had one attack day right but i don't think i ever used it but it was never like you didn't want to risk you didn't want to do anything stupid you're you, you couldn't stop the british you're just trying to slow them down but you so i mean it, it yeah it plays totally different okay yeah from the german perspective yeah on that side you couldn't really take a lot of risks the, the British could because they had so many units. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, just play your role, right? Play your role and then stick with the game plan and and see what happens. Yeah, but when you're starting, you know, when you play a regular scenario, you know within a turn, kind of, you kind of get a feel of how, how it's going to play, right? Yeah. Depending on the size of the scenario. You play one turn in a campaign game, you have no idea what's happening the next date. So it takes a long time for you to get the feel of how it's going to go, the flow and stuff in a campaign game versus a regular scenario. It's it's a it's playing a campaign game is a time commitment. Uh, I, I forget how much we estimated how long it took us to play Decision I else. And it was. Uh, what was it? 50 how some many, hours. There were five were there five dates or no, there were six dates five to eight turns each so 30 wow. to 30 to 48 turns at a campaign game scale and scott and i aren't the speediest of players <laughs> and it's a significant time commitment and yeah you have to be into it it was fun 
So I, I, I'm looking. Well, I thought it was fun. Scott kind of thought it was torture. But <laughs> decision. No, it, else, was, but... it was fun. 56 hours of torture. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, it's not something, campaign game isn't something that I would choose to play all the time. But all right. Yeah, I I highly recommend if you're into ASL, you need to play a campaign game at least once to get the experience because it's completely different. Very cool. Yeah, it's true. That's true. I've got to get it. I've got to put it on there. Or just watch your guys' game and live through your experience. Well, I mean, we us three can barely coordinate playing a regular three-player scenario. Uh, I don't know if we could coordinate playing a full game. No, no, I mean, I would just watch your replay of the, of the yeah, campaign yeah, no, game. But, the I know you and I, you and I talked about doing a multiplayer campaign game at one time. And yeah, that Just would be trying difficult. to coordinate it. Uh, yeah. yeah. As long as you're up at 3 o'clock in the morning, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you send me Discord messages at like 3. I'm like, what are you doing up? <laughs> That's what happens. You know when you know the life. <laughs> You're retired. I gotta get this shit done after hours. Uh, yeah, but I have to I get up at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, I go to bed Maybe. about six o'clock in the morning. Jeez. Uh, on the weekends. How? I don't know. Oh man. Diet Pepsi. Diet yeah. Pepsi. St- Stu Diet and Pepsi. I Stu and I played Combat Commander one time and I think we got done with it about one o'clock in the morning and, and I was like yeah, yeah, you were zoned. You Beyond were trash. But I think <laughs> Stu was just getting warmed up. He was just yeah. ready to go. Ready ready to do another one? Stacking game, Scott. Let's yeah. go. Sit up. <laughs> Scott turned into a pumpkin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I could beat a pumpkin. I think he beat me at that game. So I, I needed him to be a pumpkin. So. <laughs> uh, Root and Putin says, me and three buddies are playing SAF campaign game three. Three three weeks in, it's still only on turn. What's SAF? Root and Putin. You guys know? Uh, SAF. Maybe you meant SMF. Uh, or, uh, yeah, campaign games are a slow, you know, kind of have to nibble away at it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Manila. Okay. Sword. Oh, Sword and Fire. Duh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Got it. Cool. Yeah. Uh, do you guys have any other comments about uh, Drop Zone? No, I'm looking forward to playing the scenarios and watching you guys get that campaign game going. I'm kind of interested uh, to see to see how it plays because, I mean, historically, I mean, I'm sure it's all well balanced and everything. But, I mean, historically, the biggest attack was like on June 7th, and there were two platoons of D Company held up two battalions of Germans and a battalion of assault vehicles. Wow. See how that plays out. Yeah. 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 I don't think it'll play out like they did in history. I think that's the, when you pull the David Garvin, you just give him all the territory. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting. And you buy the 150 OBA. Yeah. We, uh, I don't know. It'll probably take us. How long did it take us to take, play Decision I else? Two months? But that was the uh, height of COVID. Six weeks. Yeah. yeah. That, that was COVID lockdown, the height of COVID. Um, I don't know. This this will probably take us, I'm guessing, a few months, maybe. Probably take a break. Well, I don't, you know, there, yeah, there's not, a, there's not a ton of units. It's, it's going to be play quicker probably than Decision at else think so yeah. yeah you're not gonna have yeah. the armor right that this else had like what 10 germans yeah, yeah i had a bunch like of that? yeah they all died but yeah know, i had a bunch of shirts <laughs> panthers i ate them for breakfast ouch yeah. Ouch, ouch. <laughs> yeah and you don't have cows to hide behind so i mean what are the british gonna do right they can't do anything about the cows i'm looking forward to it but also not looking forward to using the cows because i'm playing the germans i already know that let I'm them kidding. go let them go let them free <laughs> No, I'm going to use them, but I'm going to lament over their corpses. No. Uh, <laughs> and eat their well cardboard night. corpses. Yeah. 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 Uh, Avoid the 556 five, ammo that's going to be embedded in the cows then when you're picking them up. Jeez. Oh, 
All right, we're at uh, hour and twenty five. This went longer than I thought. Any question? Any questions or comments in chat? I'll try to pop them up on the video as they come up. If not, we'll start closing it down. I think. I don't know. Do you guys have any ideas for the next Friday Night Tactical or anyone in chat? Do you have any ideas that you want us to gab about in the next Friday Night Tactical? Hmm. I have an idea, but I'm going to I'm hmm. going to see what you guys say. OK. Uh, nothing off the top of my head right now. I, I kind of I, I like this. This is this is really enjoyable and enlightening. Forgotten anything, War Review. Anything, Scott? Putin says Forgotten War Review. Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking. OK. Well, I, I have an idea. You want to hear it? Yes. OK. Something I've been thinking about. And actually, uh, uh, thanks for stopping in, David. Um, I've, something I've been working on for actually a long time. I actually started making some slides, some graphics for it. I, I, I was or am going to make a video series um, calling it uh, Demystifying ASL or whatever. Um, ASL seems to have this stigma about it that it's impossible to learn, which is clearly false because it's one of the most, still one of the most popular Hex Encounter War games after 40 plus years. A lot of people still play it and follow it. But there's a lot of people out there that just think they don't even want to try to approach it. And I was going to make a video on how to remove their fears of approaching ASL. Um, I think that might be a good discussion to have with with some supporting evidence of why it's not that much different than a lot of war games out there as far as the required content to learn to actually play the game as opposed to the chrome as we like to call it that's just add on that you'd read when you need to read it or not at all you can choose you can choose not to play with vehicles if you wanted to right so i thought that might be a good discussion to do down the road between the three of us instead of me trying to do a series of videos because I haven't done I've been thinking about it for six months and I still haven't done it so maybe we could just do it and talk about it yeah that's legit yeah that sounds good so unless uh, there's any other ideas I didn't see any from chat other than the forgotten war review uh, maybe we'll go with that next time in two weeks or so I think we need to change Scott's avatar to a cow <laughs> yeah <laughs> The dead cow. The dead cow, live cow, whatever. <laughs> Some cow action. Uh, wardrobe, thanks for stopping in. Thank you. What David said. David said, I would offer that ASL is vastly different from other games, which is why we all love it. So it's not accessible, but it is vastly different. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's not the most accessible. Um, but I don't think it's inaccessible, as a lot of people believe, that don't really give it a try. They just think it's right. this monster that you know and i don't i don't believe well that. it's just yeah it's it all depends on how big of a jump you want to take right right yeah right. Yeah. yeah i went to uh gmt games at the warehouse uh locally luckily i'm local here and you know anytime i uh, i discuss or listen to conversations that people have about asl the first thing they mention is the thickness of the rule book and they can't overcome that fear I mean, for some reason, I'm not sure why, because all ASLers point out, look, you know, you don't even have, you don't even use 90% of it most of the time. So, yeah. and even then you forget, you know, half the rest of the stuff that you should use. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I think it's standard stuff and a lot of the little stuff you could, you know, you miss up on, but that's just like any game, right? I mean, just, oh crap, I forgot to use my supply in this operational level game or sure. some crap like that. So, yeah. Well, right. I, I think there's 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 two things. There's like learning to play ASL, and then there's mastering ASL. You know, mm -hmm. learning to play ASL is not all that tough, but you know, mastering it takes it pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> Amy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. We're kind of. Uh, she wants to moderate that one put, so we're, bad. I we're know putting she does. the cart in front of the horse, I guess. Yeah. Right. That's the saying. Yeah. 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 But I like yeah. I like David. I think I think you should put a poll up for the next two weeks. Uh, Neil, about voting on Scott's avatar, and then all the people can vote for what Scott's avatar is going to be next Where time. Where would I put the poll? Oh, I could put the poll in yeah, the on your channel. YouTube right? community section. I can yeah. do polls there. Yeah, I'll put a yeah. poll up, and you can vote on Scott's avatar for the next stream. 
Yep. Good idea, David. <laughs> but yeah, but Amy's right. Amy's Ow. right. Moo. Moo. Yeah. Moo. All right. Let's wrap. Let's wrap it up. <laughs> wrap, wrap it up. We're, we're, we're getting loopy again like we did last time, I think. Okay. I'm That's just waking for... up. Yeah. You're, <laughs> you're like, <laughs> man, I just woke up. Literally, I was sleeping until <laughs> six. <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to even come on. I'm like, where's Stu? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, let's let's wrap it up. Uh, thanks for everybody tuning in to Friday Night Tackle. This was number four. We're going to do number five probably in two weeks, and we'll talk about demystifying ASL and why it is not as inapproachable as you think it is. It is actually approachable. So if you know anyone who wants to get into ASL who or who's afraid to get into ASL, have them tune in uh, next two weeks from tonight, and we'll talk about it. All right? Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Stu. Thanks, Chad. Thank you. Yep. And we'll see you next Friday. Excellent. Ciao.